Thank you very much. Uh, my lecture will be in English. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first visit to Colombia, and I want to reinforce that those of us from the Cleveland Clinic are extremely happy to be here and be able to exchange information and experiences. Before I begin, uh, I was reflecting on the fact that not that we're at the same level, but the Pope is visiting the United States right now. And I know the Pope is from South America. The Pope will be in Philadelphia. That is where I went to medical school. And the first patient that I saw as a medical student, I went in to meet him. I was a third year medical student and I rapidly discovered that he only spoke Spanish. I left the room, I asked my supervisor what to do. He said, you have until tomorrow morning to master the Spanish language and present the case to the attending physician. I still haven't accomplished that task, so I apologize. So, acute heart failure. Uh, we have 15 minutes to cover a few highlights. Sudden or gradual onset of signs and symptoms of heart failure requiring unplanned office visits, emergency room visits, or hospitalization. Certainly in my country, this is the number one cause of hospitalization, greater than pneumonia, greater than myocardial infarction. There are one million uh, admissions per year approximately in the United States. Despite all the technology that we have, we still feel that the bedside evaluation of the patient is very much the cornerstone of deciding upon the therapeutics, whether the patient goes to intensive care unit or to the bedside. And this simple four quadrant uh, diagram that was developed by Dr. Stevenson over two decades ago, I think still applies today and that most of the patients that we see that are admitted to the wards treated with diuretics have so-called warm and wet. Why do patients come into the hospital? I'm sure the reasons are similar in your country as in the United States. Ischemia, arrhythmias, intercurrent illnesses, non-compliance, alcohol use, and what we are seeing increasingly in the United States is a higher severity of illness in our patients, where most of the patients that we see now have many comorbidities, which I know will be a topic of another lecture, but perhaps the most challenging comorbidity is chronic kidney disease. So if we reflect back on this paper published in the New England Journal in 1974, what is the state of the art of the treatment of acute heart failure? This publication indicated diuretics, vasodilators, oxygen, and to consider chronic inotropic therapy. So where are we today? If you look at this registry that is about 10 years old, it indicates that the most common therapy used in the hospital is an IV diuretic about 90% of the patients. Many of the other vasoactive agents, and you won't see levosimendin on this slide because that drug is not available in the United States. But diuretics far and away um, are the treatment of choice. And what you see on this slide is a representation that in the last 15 years, millions of dollars have been spent on multiple clinical trials that, in summary, they've all been negative and, in some cases, deleterious. So milrinone, for example, was actually shown to increase side effects. At one time, it was commonly used in the U.S. when a patient came in that was warm and wet, no longer. Levosimendin, as I mentioned, is not available. Endothelin antagonists, are not available and have not been proven efficacious for acute decompensated heart failure. 
Tolvaptan, a vasopressin antagonist, is available in the United States. It's extremely expensive and it is almost never used. Then came along the era of adenosine A1 receptor antagonists, the hope that renal function would be preserved. There were a series of clinical trials that were performed internationally, and again, there was no efficacy. And natriuretic peptides really was the last chapter representative of the scenario we have seen repeated numerous times where a small study indicates efficacy, and then a larger study with 7,000 patients shows that the nazaretide, although safe, does not offer any advantage over standard therapy. If you look at this from the standpoint of strategies, what are the different approaches that one may take? So first, let me mention the dose trial. This was a relatively small study performed in the United States. Very simply looked at a chronic infusion of furosemide versus bolus therapy. And it basically told us, take your pick. Either one works fine. They both have the same efficacy when you look at weight loss, length of stay, et cetera. If you wanted to ask me what the bias is, I would tell you that the bias certainly at the Cleveland Clinic is a continuous infusion is used more often than bolus therapy. There was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for ultrafiltration. And ultrafiltration was shown in a series of small studies, perhaps to be efficacious, perhaps to be more effective at removing volume and weight loss and preserving renal function. And again, funded through the National Institutes of Health, through a heart failure network in the United States, and I'll show you the reference in a minute, there was no efficacy. I was involved in uh, research both with nazaretide as well as with dopamine. And in both cases, small studies showed efficacy. We published a paper called DADHF that looked at dopamine and we speculated that dopamine would provide protection of renal function in the setting of acute heart failure. We came back and did a larger study, DADHF2, as well as the ROSE acute heart failure study and the heart failure network, and both of these studies concluded no efficacy from dopamine. The pulmonary artery catheter is a topic that many times comes up. And it's expensive. It's only utilized in an intensive care unit. And the definitive data on this came from a trial known as ESCAPE. This was a series of publications where patients that were essentially warm and wet were randomized to receive a PA catheter or standard therapy. And again, there was no benefit shown. Our use of a pulmonary artery catheter at the Cleveland Clinic is really reserved to patients that fail standard therapy in a regular nursing unit, are hypotensive or in shock, and go to our intensive care unit. So this is just a slide from the New England Journal publication on ultrafiltration. And what you see in the red circle is that with ultrafiltration, there was an equivalent amount of weight loss as with pharmacologic therapy, but if anything, there was a greater increase in worsening renal function. The creatinine was elevated. There was actually an editorial written by Milton Packer at the time this was published who gave a cautionary warning that you may be doing more harm than good if you use ultrafiltration, and our nephrologists rarely now will use ultrafiltration, and there's been many other publications that have come out since then, except when the patient is told this will be palliative therapy, and you may very well proceed from ultrafiltration to needing some sort of permanent dialytic therapy. This is the source uh, reference from the low-dose dopamine or low-dose nazaretide 
This was a dose of nazaratide even lower than what was used in Ascend HF with the hypothesis that it would provide some renal protection. The primary endpoints were renal, urinary volume, and cystatin C, a very sensitive biomarker of renal injury. Primary endpoint was not met. So last, let's mention serolaxin. And I mentioned serolaxin because we don't have definitive information on serolaxin yet. So a recombinant human relaxin-2, everyone is aware this is a peptide that naturally occurs in the setting of pregnancy, causes relaxation of the smooth muscle, it has many other biological effects. This publication in Lancet created a lot of enthusiasm, led to um, a look by the FDA and the US for rapid approval. It was not granted. And furthermore, there was a lot of interesting biomarker data that came out to suggest that this compound may provide some protection to the kidneys and the liver and other organs in the setting of acute decompensated heart failure. So what you see on these figures that were published in Lancet was that the, the primary endpoint was a 60-day endpoint. And looking at the Kaplan-Meier estimate for time to the first cardiovascular death or a heart failure rehospitalization, there was no statistically significant difference. And if you look at the independent uh, components, cardiovascular death and rehospitalization, Again, there is no significant difference. There's a lot of biomarker data. This was published in that separate publication. And, and what this indicates is a suggestion, perhaps, that this drug may protect the kidneys, may have some beneficial effect on protecting the liver in the setting. And certainly, if you look at the troponins, maybe some cardioprotective effects. What the authors did, which was not uh, part of the study, is they pulled some data from a prior study. They took the study from a lax HF, and then they looked at a 180-day endpoint of all-cause death. And lo and behold, they generated a hazard ratio of 0.63 and a p-value to try to create, in my words, a lot of hype that this compound may reduce mortality if given up front for acute decompensated heart failure. This was really not in the setting of a randomized clinical trial. This was pooled data. So this has led to the conclusions that this drug will relieve dyspnea. It may have protective effects. Uh, the 180-day cardiovascular and all-cause mortality may be reduced. It had no effect on rehospitalizations, so there is now a large international study underway with a six-month mortality endpoint to try to give a definitive answer to this question. This is RELAX HF2. This is ongoing. It's not quite fully enrolled. So lastly, I want to mention the concept of what happens to the patient with acute heart failure. They leave the hospital, and then what's next? And I think we're increasingly cognizant of the fact that we have to pay attention to the transition from the hospital to the home, and we have to be able to monitor the patient. One example, and there are many, is this so-called CardioMEMS device which is a uh, sensor placed in the pulmonary artery. It's done by an electrophysiologist, a heart failure doctor, an interventional cardiologist. It provides daily outputs of pulmonary artery pressures. And what you see from this publication by uh, Dr. Abraham and colleagues, it actually will provide pulmonary systolic and diastolic pressures, so you can track these pressures. What was done in this study is the two groups were randomized. In one group, the physicians had the pulmonary artery pressures 
could adjust the uh, diuretics and vasodilators after discharge. And indeed, they were able to show very striking reduction in hospitalization with monitoring. The caution that applies in my country and I'm sure in the rest of the world is that this sensor, and this was just written up in the Wall Street Journal in the United States, the, the commercial cost of this sensor is approximately $17,000. So there's a, there's a challenge now to incorporate this type of technology, even if it is efficacious because of the cost and determining really if the value is there. So in summary, I would like to conclude by saying that IV diuretics, continuous infusion, or bolus remain the mainstay of therapy. We strive to convert the patient to oral diuretics before discharge. Guideline-directed medical therapy is essential, which I will comment on in a subsequent presentation this morning. It's generally best, because there's no data, to avoid empiric inotropes and nazaretide. It's a standard of care to measure the ejection fraction. We all know that half the patients have normal ejection fractions now in our hospitals, but it has implications for other treatment, including defibrillators. It's always best to have stable renal function and hopefully a reduction in biomarkers, BNP. Education and teaching is essential. And now a core component of all treatment in the United States is close follow-up, and every patient that is discharged now is asked to come back at seven days in our clinics for a checkup when they leave the hospital. So this is a diagram which shows what we're trying to build in our health system in the United States as far as uh, transitional care models. We know we have to risk stratify patients we know some patients will frequently be readmitted. They have cognitive impairment. They have many comorbidities. They need the most intensive monitoring and surveillance that we can provide. Everyone needs teaching and education. We need heart failure clinics. We need better ways of communication and monitoring. Thank you very much.